Welcome to the Making Sense Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Just a note to say that if you're hearing this, you are not currently on our subscriber feed and will only be hearing the first part of this conversation. In order to access full episodes of the Making Sense Podcast, you'll need to subscribe at samharris.org. There you'll find our private RSS feed to add to your favorite podcatcher, along with other subscriber-only content. We don't run ads on the podcast, and therefore it's made possible entirely through the support of our subscribers. So if you enjoy what we're doing here, please consider becoming one. Today I'm speaking with Will Storr. Will is an award-winning writer, and his work has appeared in The Guardian, The Sunday Times, The New Yorker, and The New York Times. He's the author of many books, most recently The Status Game, on social position and how we use it. And that is largely the topic of today's conversation. We talk about the role that status plays in human life and culture. We discuss the taboo around caring about status, egalitarianism, the perpetual insecurity of status, how we play multiple status games simultaneously, identity, social connection, dominance, virtue, success, status urge as an evolved mechanism, gossip, status and health, the consequence of humiliation, the role of social media, status and politics, conspiracy thinking, moral panics, status and philanthropy, and other topics. Status is one of those things that once you begin thinking about it, you see it everywhere and realize that it was doing its mad work all the while without you thinking much about it. Anyway, it's a fascinating and all-too-consequential subject. And now I bring you Will Storr. I am here with Will Storr. Will, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Sam. So I loved your book. The book is The Status Game on Social Position and How We Use It. And I want us to just dive deep into that topic. But before we do, perhaps you can summarize your background as a writer, journalist, uh, however you think of yourself. What have you focused on and how do you describe your place in the world at the moment? Yeah, well, I I was a journalist for 20 years and now I sort of focus on books really. And I I guess most of my nonfiction focuses on, you know, looks at kind of how science can explain the human condition, really, who we are. And what other topics did you hit before status? Oh, so my first book was written in my 20s, was about the supernatural. It was like a, you know, kind of a slightly lighthearted adventure uh, with, you know, ghost hunters and people like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was really about, um, you know, why people believe in, you know, crazy things. You you didn't Uh, find any ghosts? No, no. some odd things happened, I have to say, Mm. but no, uh, you know. I didn't find any ghosts. And um, the next book was The Heretics, which was published in the US as The Unpersuadables. And that book looked at the question of how is it that otherwise intelligent people could end up believing crazy things? So not stupid people, but really smart people. So I did things in that book, like I, I went on this really weird holiday with the historian david irving who mm-hmm. is you know no, I don't know if you're familiar with him I'm yeah sure why. yeah but notorious please he, summarize yeah yeah he, i mean he, he was once highly respected historian of the second world war we know most of what we do about the fire bombing of dresden because of david irving's scholarship and then at some point in his career he decided that hitler was in his words a friend of the jews and had nothing to do with the holocaust uh-huh. and you know he's doggedly pursued this line uh, this belief, and, and it has literally destroyed him. It's destroyed his reputation. It's destroyed him financially. He went to prison. He was actually in prison. He was given the opportunity uh, in an Austrian court to, you know, renounce his views on the Holocaust, and he he refused and and and, and went to prison. I think in his he might have been in his seventies. Um, you know, he was famously sued by an author. Mm-hmm. There, there was a film made about that court case. Uh, so, you know, this is a guy who is, you can say whatever you like about David Irving, but he's a smart guy. <laughs> he's intelligent. Uh, and yet, you know, he has come upon this insane belief that is, you know, literally to most people unbelievable. I forgot how far his denial went. Did he go so far as to say the 
gas chambers weren't gas chambers and examining the the ruins of the crematoria and saying that none of this is as advertised? Well, temporarily he did. He went through a temporary phase of kind of Holocaust denial um, when he read a paper. Like I think somebody somebody went to Auschwitz or somewhere and chipped some um, material off mm-hmm. the wall of a gas chamber and had it analysed yeah. for its concentration of it like deadly B, gases. Yeah. That's it, right? Yeah. And and they said, you know, this um, this is a weaker level that you need to kill cockroaches. So it's impossible to think that millions of people were killed this way. But um, it didn't occur to this person actually cockroaches are much more hardy than the human beings. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, 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 but you know, to, to be fair to David Irving, he did then kind of walk back that belief. But you know, also to be fair to the truth, one of the things that I did when I was with him, I was undercover, pretending that I was also a kind of you know a revisionist, mm. right wing revisionist historian, and we went to um, a former concentration camp in Poland, and you know, he was walking past the guards towers and he was saying things like you know there's the box office and when we got into the actual gas chamber it was extremely upsetting to watch there there, there was a, a, a school group of uh young girls i think they were from russia um is my memory and, and he started and the, the group started barracking them about how ridiculous they were believing this stuff and he he was saying that the doors on the gas chamber were fake he said were, these, these are just standard air raid blast doors that you know the, the, the i think somebody was saying that the the locks were on the wrong side and things. So, you know, if you call him a Holocaust denier, he'll, he'll sue you. But th- there's certainly lots of e- extreme revisionism going on with him and his followers. Mm. That's interesting. I wasn't expecting to talk about this, but um, I'm wondering what you think about the ethics of going undercover. What was that experience like? And I mean, it's, it's just my generic take on this is that there are many stories that couldn't be told. Uh, or couldn't be told adequately unless some people were willing to deceive others about who they are. I mean, to go properly undercover, you know, whether from a, a law enforcement point of view or, a, you know, an espionage point of view or a journalistic one. But what was that experience like? And, and what do you personally think about the ethics of it? Uh, the ethics for me are straightforward. You know, I'm interested in the truth. I'm not interested in just dismissing these people as, oh, they're evil. That's a story. I actually want to know, what, you know, okay, you know, rather than calling them names, how can we explain these people believing what they do? So that, that, that's my take on the ethics. It's pretty, you know, straightforward. Do you think there was no way to embed with the heretics or the um, conspiracy theorists in a truly above board, honest way, just saying, listen, I, you know, I, I, you know I, don't, I don't want to demonize you guys. I want to understand you. I don't actually share your beliefs, but you know, I, I'm really here to have an honest conversation. Sure. I mean, it's, it's, it, most of the book is, is, it was above board. I think, I think this was the only chapter I went undercover in, and that's because there's David Irving, is, there's no way I would have got anywhere near him mm-hmm. um, if I'd have, you know, and, and, and you know, and I, I didn't lie. <laughs> in the email to him, I said, I'm writing a book on people who have the courage to stand up to the orthodoxy, right. and you know, you're, you're one of them. So yes, there was some flattery going on. <laughs> But 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 uh, and and actually almost went wrong because it, on the first day of the sort of a seven or eight day trip I interviewed him and 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 was obviously too forthright in my views and he kind of can't stop the interview and uh, it was very difficult then to get him to agree to sit down which he did eventually so so, so yeah I did almost give the game away mm. I, I mean the experience that you asked it was it was kind of surprising because you know aside from being unbelievable anti-Semites. Th- these were ordinary men, you know, and they, 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 w- w- when they found out that um, David Irving wasn't cooperating with me anymore, with my project, I- every day after our kind of road trip, we'd, we'd, we'd sit down and have a, you know, there'd be a lecture from David and a question and answer session. And I found out towards the end that the guys had sort of conspired between them to ask lots of questions I thought would be helpful for me and my my, my project writing about heretics. So, so, so you know, they, they behave very kindly towards me. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, it, it, again, it's that, that whole thing that, that they're not monsters, that, that they are people who've made a, they've made a mistake. Yeah. So what do you, and again, I wasn't planning to hit this topic. And I, obviously, I haven't read that book of yours, but I'm just fascinated by why people believe crazy things and what, you know, what, especially why smart people and even well-informed people, even you know, too well-informed people in some 
perverse way, believe crazy things. What did you conclude about that process? I mean, how do you explain it to yourself? Obviously, this is a problem that has only grown in scope and consequence in recent years, given the way conspiracy theories are amplified on social media and given the the reaction to the ham-fisted efforts to contain the spread of misinformation, you know, the blacklisting on uh, social media or the shadow banning or whatever else Twitter and, and Facebook currently do, that freaks everyone out when they have unorthodox information they think really must spread, whether it's about vaccines or uh, anything else, politics. Uh, so what, what's, your, what's your sense of the cognitive, emotional, social, cultural conditions that we're trying to put right here? Well, I mean, the answer that I got to in The Heretics was, was my introduction to the idea that the, the brain is a storyteller. And, you know, in, in the book, I, I describe the brain as, as a hero maker. It wants to make a, a he, us a hero in the story of our lives. And what tends to happen is that any kind of fact in inverters that we, inverted commas that we come across that flatters that heroic mm. story, that heroic sense of who we are, we, we uncritically accept it usually. And any fact in inverted commas we come across, which challenges that heroic story of who we are, we're very good at rejecting. And so the brain isn't particularly interested in the truth. The brain's much more interested in motivating us, getting out of bed, telling a heroic story about who we are and you know, what, what's in store for us in the future. In the specific case of the Holocaust deniers, the people who were on the trip with David Irving, what was extraordinary was the number of men whose parents had served on the side of the Nazis in the Second World War. Hmm. In fact, on the final night, there was this gala showing of the film Downfall, the, the kind of hyper-realistic German film about the final days in the Hitler bunker. And one of these guys, an Australian guy, he, he, he didn't want to watch the film because his dad was in the bunker with Hitler hmm. and he would found it too distressing to watch the film. So, I mean, to me, that, that, that it, it felt like these were men who'd grown up with Nazi parents and they, 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 wouldn't, they wouldn't allow themselves to believe the story that the culture tells us, that the Nazi, Nazis are synonym for evil and the Holocaust really happened. And they felt like they were on this great cognitive kind of mission, a lot of them, to prove that their mums and dads, probably their, you know, who they loved, weren't evil and, and all this stuff wasn't really true. So, so, so that, that, that was, you know, that, that was... A, a, an insight I wasn't expecting to have when I kind of pitched up with these people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that leads us rather nicely to the topic at hand, which is status. But uh, before we go there, I was wondering, did you ever deal with the case of David Icke? I've met David Icke. Yeah. He threw me out of his house. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what what is going on there? What, who, who is David Icke for people? Uh, I think he's probably more famous across the pond than he is here. What's his story? David Icke's an extraordinary individual. So he was a, a footballer and then he was a famous BBC TV sports presenter. And then his father died and he had what I believe is a very profound nervous breakdown and an episode of psychosis. It, uh, but his kind of brain dealt with this chaos by telling a story in which he was kind of the second coming, mm -hmm. that he was basically God, Jesus. And, and, and uh, I remember seeing it, I actually saw it in, uh, in the 80s. Uh, he was on this big chat show, Wogan, which is a bit like the Letterman show. Uh, and Wogan was interviewing him about all this stuff. And the, the audience was acutely uncomfortable to watch because the audience were laughing at him openly and uh, uh, the things he was saying. So David Icke has always been seen as this kind of absolute lunatic, you know. I mean, and, and you know, I, 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 if you read his um, memoirs. I, I'm, I'm sure he had a, uh, an episode of psychosis. But extraordinarily, he's kind of reborn now as this conspiracy theorist who manages to sell out, you know, hundreds seat, um, seat theaters. He sells huge amounts of books, and and he, he seemed to really rise after the uh, after 9/11. Where he, and, and he's kind of mad genius is to take all the all the individual conspiracy theories like Illuminati mm. uh, and so on. And connect them all into one grand conspiracy theory, uh, and it involves basically high status people like the Queen and JFK being secret shape shifting lizards. He mm -hmm. believes the moon is a space station, a hollowed out space station. Uh, but he's got huge amounts of followers now, so he's kind of reborn as this um, 
kind of it's kind of like the British Alex Jones, but yeah. much even crazier than that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's what how how I have him pegged. He's like Alex Jones, except the pedophiles are are actually lizard people. <laughs> lizard people, shape shifting lizard <laughs> yes. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, yeah, as I say, yeah, as I say, he, he threw me out of his his house when when he felt I was insufficiently um, well read on his <laughs> endless, you know, multi thousand page books. Wow. Okay. Well, so status. What what is status? I think people have a gut feeling for the concept, but I, I bet many people would be hard pressed to give it anything like a coherent definition. How do you think about status? Well, it's simply the feeling of being valued. Uh, sometimes when you talk about status, people think, oh, he's saying that everybody wants to be rich. He's saying that everybody wants to be famous and a celebrity. And of course, wealth and fame are part of status. But, 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 but all status really is, is the feeling of being of value. So when psychologists you know, look at our kind of deep needs, our deep cravings, they find we have a craving for belongingness and connection. That's one thing. You know, we don't. We want to be loved, and we want to join groups. You know, we're tribal, obviously. But once we're in those groups, there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of urge to move up, to feel not just loved but valued, and that's what status is. I can hear there's going to be a subliminal tug of war between my saying status and your saying status, <laughs> but I, I I think we should both stick to our um, respective countries here. I think so. So. Yeah, it's and yet desire for status is taboo. It isn't taboo to say that you would want to be valued by the people in your life or by your community and that you want to have a positive, you want to be seen to be making positive contributions to society, etc. But there's something tawdry or perceived to be tawdry about people's concern about status and, you know, its hallmarks. I mean, certainly when you're talking in terms of wealth and fame, you know, you, you know even virtue signaling now is, is part of this picture where, you know, any, any self-consciousness with respect to how one is being perceived by others is viewed as, um, you know, venal or in, in, in some other way, something you should be able to rise above. How do you how do you think about the taboo aspect of seeking status? I, I think it's because we're all so chippy about our own status that 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 we just don't like it at all. If anybody was to admit that, that they were interested in it, and, and we don't like it, you know, and and I think there's a taboo against, as you say, against ourselves admitting it. I, you know, it, it's I think it's connected to the fact that we people don't like self-aggrandizing people they don't like people who present as if they deserve high status when anthropologists look at pre-modern groups hunter-gatherer groups you know they're often described as egalitarian but as people like the psychology professor paul bloom has pointed out they're only egalitarian because the people in those groups care so very much about status they're constantly jostling and there are con there are constant checks mm. and balances so if somebody you know go, goes in there and claims to be a great hunter and comes in all proud of their catch, then there will be a an effort by the group to pull that person down and and, and to and to and to get them to act in humility. In the book I write about a, a pre modern group in the north of Canada who have a have a tradition of singing of, of circling a person who's too hubristic and singing a song of derision mm -hmm. <laughs> in their faces. Yeah. So so I I think the taboo against kind of admitting even to ourselves that we're interested in status is connected to all of that stuff. Yeah, although the you know one of the the master hacks of that system is you can rise in status by not taking yourself too seriously. You only become an object of, a successful object of derision if you can't laugh at yourself. And there are different careers that are more amenable to this than others, but I mean, how, how do you view the insecurity of status? I mean, really, this is a point you make in your book at some point. It, it, status is perpetually insecure, really, no matter mm. who you are. I mean, you're always liable to slip on the ice and fall in front of a crowd. And it's kind of funnier the higher status you were. You know, if you're a, an aristocrat in a top hat and, a, and an overcoat <laughs> and you fall on the ice, that's just hilarious. And so, 
How do you view the perpetual insecurity of status and people's efforts to shore it up? Well, yeah. So, so I, I think that's why people get so chippy about status. One of the reasons is because what is it? You can't own status. It's not a material object. You can't, you know, money is a symbol of status that you might use to measure your status, or you might not, depending on who, what, what you like. But, it, you know, it isn't money. Uh, you, you never own your status. You can't take it to bed and lock it in a box. So it's always up for grabs. It's always in question. It, you know, Elon Musk can be reduced in status in conversation with somebody that he admires and respects if they treat him disparagingly. Michelle Obama, somebody as high status as her or Beyonce, equally might feel very low status if they were treated with disrespect by somebody that they, that they admire. So, you know, we're constantly uh, measuring our status. In the, in the book I write about... Um, Neuroscientists talk about how we how we have this thing in the brain called they call the status detection system, mm. which is constantly measuring everything um, in, uh, as a way of gauging our status. So, so it measures things like the amount of eye contact we're getting with numerical precision. In one study, they looked at people being served measures of orange juice, and they, they found that if you serve lots of measures of orange juice to people, but one person gets slightly less orange juice than everybody else, mm. they're going to get preoccupied with it and get upset about it. And of course, we completely understand that because as human beings with, you know, who all own status detection systems, we know full well that what you're upset about isn't the fact that you've got half a mouthful less of orange juice than the next person. It's that your, your status detection system has read that as an insult, as, a, as, as, okay, so I'm not as valuable as all these other people because you're giving me less juice. Yeah, I mean, that. that- that's connected to, and maybe it's really of a piece with a broader principle here, which is that people's sense of their own well-being is so often anchored to comparison with a lot of others, right? And, and so it's not based on some absolute measure of, of well-being. And that's why, you know, all boats rising with the same tide doesn't really solve most people's problems, because even if things get better and better for them, they, th- they see things getting better and better for their neighbor who already had much more than them. And actually, this is a point explicitly made in your book by Karl Marx, if I recall, which I I, I never, I wasn't aware that Marx hit on this. (laughs) And, you know, he was, he was not a dummy uh, for all the the chaos born of his economic Mm. theories. And uh, yeah, he said, you know, basically, uh, if you have a tiny little house, that's going to be fine as long as everyone else has a tiny little house. But if there's a palace next door, your tiny little house is now going to be perceived as a a hut or a hovel, and uh, mm. you'll be unhappy. Well, I, we'll get to any ways in which you draw lessons from this uh, later on. But um, one point you just made, which um, at least implicitly, was that we, we only tend to care about others' view of us and th- therefore mark our status this way insofar as we respect the other people, which is to say, based on how we perceive their status. I mean, the status they hold for us is the cash value of their opinion of us and is the thing that can raise or lower our status, or at least to some degree. And yeah. I, yeah, I just had a recent experience of this. I, you know, perhaps you noticed it online. I had a what purported to be a, a real conflagration and uh, witch burning uh, you know, on, on Twitter where I, where I was the witch, but it took place in exclusively right-wing circles and explicitly you know it was in happening in Trumpistan under you know among Trump's most avid defenders and um, what was interesting you know psychologically in my experience is how little I cared about the you know the human sacrifice uh, you know that, that I had become because of how I view the people who were you know dancing on my grave because in my world, anyone who is defending Trump to that degree at this point really has low status. Yeah. Like I basically, I know I don't agree with almost anything that is uh, underwriting their opinion of me there. And so it really, it, it really didn't matter, except I saw one writer whose work I admire sort of, I mean, he didn't, he wasn't all in on my uh, auto de fe, but he was he caught some of the, the, the pleasures of, of being had at my expense. And like that one person, you know, that stung because I actually like that person, right? And, can, and admire his writing. 
So it was it was interesting just to see that bifurcation in my mind, and it was um, yeah. Anyway, that's uh, perhaps you have some yeah. something to say about that. No, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. So, so, so what 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 they find is that we're not playing a status game with everybody in the world. We, we play multiple status games. You know, we have these. You know, we 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 we're kind of tribal in 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 the sense that we're members of lots of tribes all at once, and we care about what the our kind of co-players in these tribes think of us. But people outside our tribes, I mean, sure, if anybody insults you, you're going to feel something probably. But as you say, if if you have contempt for these people, if we actually actively consider them low status, it's no way it's not going to sting anywhere near as much as somebody in your game with you who you, you know a mm. and, and b especially if they're in your game with you and they're and you perceive them as to be above you in that status game then those are the ones that really burn yeah and it really it's impressively multidimensional and and it's it shifts because you can be it can be for the purpose of any specific encounter or conversation who has high status and who doesn't so you can be an academic you know who you know, almost by definition, doesn't have a lot of money or doesn't have a lot of fame. But in a certain dinner party conversation, that person can be very high status when they're, you know, they're opining on their topic. And, you know, if the billionaire at the table will feel lower status intellectually when dealing on that topic. But then things flip when you're talking about money or fame, and it goes round and round, depending on what the the matter at hand actually is yeah and it's how you're measuring status you know we we, we we're so amazing at playing these status games we can use anything as uh, to, to, to measure status it's certainly not all about money you know my wife and i have been to you know places like saint tropez in france places where we could you know we, we're surrounded we're, we're in the bottom one percent of wealthy people mm. in saint tropez but even we, you know, we managed to look down our noses at a lot of them because oh, they're such oh, they're so oh, they're so gauche, you know. This oh, look at that, you know, like like it's it's not about money. So it's, it's you know we, we've got our own ways of measuring status. They've got their own ways of measuring status. No, they they, they were looking us <laughs> and, mm. and and seeing these you know scruffy Herberts who with, with with bad shoes who shouldn't be there, and, and we were looking at them as these ridiculously over the top you know orange skinned idiots. So, so, so yeah, it, 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 it all depends on how you're measuring status, how you're, how you're assessing status. Every game has its different, almost like tokens, you know, like, like on the Monopoly board, you've got plastic houses and hotels. Every game's got its different way of, a different thing of standing for status. And all of this connects to the concept of identity. How do you think about identity in light of the sort of never-ending possibility of finding new status games and having one supersede the next. Just how do you think of personhood, I mean, perhaps a healthy sense of personhood in light of that landscape? Well, I mean, it's huge. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, to, to a great extent, we, we become the games that we play. You know, when I say I'm a writer, that I'm not talking about what I do for a job. That's a, a massive part of my identity because that's, 95% of the, <laughs> the source of the status in my life, which is an un- un- unhealthy, you know, um, uh, amount really. So, you know, we, we join groups, the groups have rules of behavior. Um, we, we follow the rules and the better we follow the rules, the higher we climb in status. You know, we begin to dress like those kinds of people, talk like those kinds of people, read the kind of books and in, uh, consume art in the way that those kinds of people read books and consume art. Hmm. Y- you know, p- identity is fluid and multiple. We can be one one person when we're engaged in one status pursuit, maybe at work, and then at the weekend when we're with our you know cycling friends, we can be another kind of version of us playing another status game. So uh, you can't separate the status game from identity. You know, as I, I, you know, I really do believe that that to to, to a great extent, as I say, we, we we become those games that we play. You know, we we, we become conformist in that group context, uh, and. and in, in terms of you know how should we pursue these games, uh, and this is where I become a bit hypocritical because I'm not very good at doing this myself. But but the research is that, that that we're kind of happier and more stable emotionally the more groups we belong to. So I think the mm-hmm. more status games we play, the more sources of status that we have, the more we hedge 
the better place we are. You know, I'm in a vulnerable position because my life is devoted to my writing. And if, and if that was to go wrong, I mean, it, you know, my, my career will peak and decline like anybody's does. It's going to be more than just a disappointment for my career. It's going to be uh, an assault on my identity and an assault on my sense of who I am. Yes, it's also interesting how some of the, the markers of status can flip. So I was thinking, as you were speaking about um, what's happened just with dress as a, a social signal. In certain contexts, dressing in fancy, expensive clothing is a marker of high status. But in other contexts, it's actually a marker of low status or, or, or certainly lower status when compared to the billionaire who just shows up in a hoodie because he can, you know, like there's no reason if you're Mark Zuckerberg, you know, I guess if you're, you're dragged before Congress, you put on a, on a suit, but, a suit. <laughs> but, but when you're in every other situation, the fact that you just roll in in a hoodie is a sign that, well, you don't have to play the game of wearing nice clothes, right? I mean, like, you know, I don't think this is necessarily conscious on his part or anyone else's part. And I now, as I complete this sentence, I'm forced to reflect on the fact that I've been wearing hoodies with disconcerting <laughs> regularity. But um, there is something about just being, when you're of sufficient status in a certain context, you don't have to try, you know, you don't have to put yeah. on airs. You don't, there's no pretense that you need to have because you're the genuine article. Well, uh, except I'd say there is a there there are airs and there is there is pretense. It's just that I think dress is an it, it, well all, all of the kind of status cues that we adorn ourselves with is always an arms race. You know, we're we're always looking at what other people are doing and wanting to one better. And I think I, I think when you get to the to the very top, that's that's the way that you can do it. I mean, my my wife um, and up until recently was the editor of Elle magazine, the the, the fashion magazine mm -hmm. in the UK, and she would always tell me that. Um, the people in the fashion industry don't wear all that very expensive stuff. They, they, they tend to dress in black and have their hair pulled back. Uh, and that always made me think of, weirdly, of Hitler, because <laughs> Hitler was the same, wasn't he? He just wore, he didn't wear all his military stuff. He just wore, you know, with medals and all that stuff like um, Hermann Goering did. He just wore a plain uniform because, the, because cause the, you know, what do you do when all the people at the, when you're above the people at the, <laughs> you know, at the very top of the status game who are all, adorned in their finery we just go the other way you signal that i don't need, you know the pose is i don't even need that mm -hmm. but of course it's still a pose you're, you're still marking yourself out as separate from the other high, you know elite people around you so but there, in your book you you describe some other principles here which can balance this out i mean like for instance connection what's the relationship between social connection and status well, I, I mean, it's linked when you when you think of the concept of the status game. You know, when, when I talk about status games, it's just a proxy for tribe. You know, we're, we're a tribal animal, uh, and that's why we crave connection and status. We, we time and time and time again collect into groups. Those groups have rules, and then you know, the better we play by those rules, and the, you know, the, the the better we play in the context of of that group, the higher we rise in status, and the better. The conditions of our life get within that group. So, you know, connection is is an indivisible part of the status game. Uh, but, but as I say in the book, it's it's not enough. Uh, it, we like to think of, about connection a lot because it's it it feels like it's something nice about humans that that we're, we love belongingness and we love being loved and and that's true. But once we've connected into any group, we we, we rarely content to be to kind of flop about on the bottom rungs, considered likable but useless. You know, mm -hmm. we, we want to feel like, okay, they like me, but do they value me? You know, do they, do they, do that, uh, do I impress them? Is there, are there things that they look at? They think, well, well, he or she is good at that. So, 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 you know, and when you, when you think about that, you know, the concept of the status game of, of, of the groups and, and, and the contest for status, that, that is all of human social life outside the family. That's religions, that's corporations, that's cults, that's, you know, football teams, that, you name it, that's what we're doing. We're gathering into groups, playing by rules and rising and falling in status, depending on how well, you know, we serve those rules. That, you know, that, you know, connection and status is kind of what we do as human beings. For you now, as you've thought about this, at this sort of depth, what I'm hearing is that there's really, you're not envisioning an alternative 
to caring about status. I mean, it, there's obviously the the embarrassing and petty and tawdry end of this, but there's also the idealistic, ennobling, you know, virtuous end as well. Am I hearing you correctly? That it's not a matter of getting out of the status game. It's in finding a healthy, life-affirming, connection-inducing, creative version of it. Well, it's about playing the right game. So, you know, I, I think there are there are basically three different genres of status game that, that that humans generally play. There are three kinds of status game. The first kind of status game is the dominance game, and we've been playing dominance games for millions of years since before we were human. You know, dominance is aggression or the threat of it. So when hens peck each other to establish a pecking order, that's a dominance game. We still do that, you know. We, obviously, we still do that. It's not, and it's not just physical violence; it's also any kind of coercion, bullying, ostracization, any kind of threat. Anytime somebody is forcing you to attend to them in kind of humility, uh, mm. as if they're a high status person, that's dominance. So that's dominance. There's also the virtue game. You know, uh, when we became human and became tribal, you know, one of the ways we could earn status is by being virtuous. And so, virtue is all about knowing the rules, following the rules, enforcing the rules. And it's also about belief, you know, how well and how sincerely do you believe the stories and myths and legends and laws of the tribe? Um, so that's, that, that's the virtue game. And you can, you can see people like the Pope, the Dalai Lama, Michelle Obama. These are kind of superstars, global superstars of the virtue game. Mm. You know, they're, they're, they're famous for being good. You know, the, over here in the UK, the royal family is a kind of virtue game. Uh, it's all about deference and respect and believing in all your heart that the queen <laughs> and a fucked up family are really mm. special and important. And, you know, uh, so that's a virtue game. But there's also the success game. You know, the other way that you could earn status and be a, seen as a valuable person in the tribal context is by being good at stuff, being a good storyteller, a good tuba finder, a good warrior, um, a good sorcerer, and so on. And, you know, that's modernity, that's civilization. Even, as I say in the book, even you know, Adam Smith, the father of capitalism, recognized that it wasn't pursuit of money that you know, made the world go round and that, and that made progress happen. And it was the pursuit of what he called esteem. It, it's that people want to feel in, like, important in the eyes of their peers. So you don't want to get rid of the status game. You know, I, I, I really believe that we are, make a fundamental mistake when we condescend to the status urge. Like it's certainly the very worst of human nature. And in the book, you know, I write about status and its connection to everything from serial killers to genocide to kind of incel misogynist culture and spree killers. Yeah. But it's also the best of human nature. You don't get modernity without the status game. You don't get progress. You don't get science. You don't get technology. You don't get vaccines and so on and so on and so on. Yeah. And it just seems like having a social process that reinforces value right? The value people create for others, the value people get in being recognized for creating value for others. And there's just a positive feedback loop there. I mean, that is the healthy form of esteem is the social mechanism that inspires people to do more and more that other people value, right? I mean, apart from just yeah. month, month being paid for it, obviously, is the material version of that. But Contributing to society and having society tell you they want more of that and to feel better as a result, that is a, a virtuous piece of machinery that I think we would, yeah, I mean, may, perhaps there's, there's a way of psychologically uncoupling even from that and being happier still. I mean, that's you know, there is certainly the notion of self-transcendence within, mm. you know, an explicitly contemplative context would argue for that. And I, I mean, perhaps we could have a sidebar conversation on that topic. But, you know, short of that, what it means to be a good person in a healthy society entails actually adding to the well-being of others in addition to, I mean, or finding a mode of fulfilling one's own desires that is actually positive sum with respect to the desires of uh, and well-being of others. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's incredible and fantastic that our species has, has evolved this instinct to reward ourselves and other people when they prove that they are, they are of value. You know, when we, you know, we even do it to ourselves. Uh, you know, sometimes the, uh, you know, researchers write about what they call the imaginary audience that we have in our heads. If you'd like to continue listening to this conversation, 
you'll need to subscribe at samharris.org. Once you do, you'll get access to all full-length episodes of the Making Sense podcast, along with other subscriber-only content, including bonus episodes and AMAs and the conversations I've been having on the Waking Up app. The Making Sense podcast is ad-free and relies entirely on listener support. And you can subscribe now at samharris.org.